Ready? Good evening. Um, there's a bit of a delay with this streaming. So um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat of wherever you are throughout the presentation. And I'll probably just answer them at the end since um, by the time I see them, we'll probably be past that point a little bit. But in the meantime, I want to wait another minute before I get started with the presentation in case there's some other people running late like I kind of am. Um, so feel free to say hi in the chat and let me know you're there and who you are or where you're, I was going to say calling in from, but this isn't a phone call. It's the internet. <laughs> um, but yeah, feel free to jump in there. And then I'm also probably while um, I'm giving this presentation, I'm going to turn my camera off just to, that seems to make the, the quality of the videos and stuff a little bit better. Um, and then I'll come back at the end of the Q&A. Oh, Annika. Hi, Annika. Nice to see you. Hey, Jeff. Nice to see you, too. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and cut my camera off and get started. Sorry about that, having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, definitely let me know if there's really, really long pauses without me saying anything, because generally I don't stop talking. Um, I just want to make sure everything's working. Hi, Rigo, that's in Albuquerque. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so this was our very, very first time we laid eyes on our very first den, which was a Western Diamondback Rattlesnake Den, not too far outside of Tucson, Arizona, um, near another study site we were working at. I think this picture was taken in 2004. Um, and as you can imagine, like most people who love snakes and love rattlesnakes, we were really excited to be shown this den and it was just a spectacular one. Um, unlike a lot of the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake Dens that, that I've seen at this point, um, this wasn't a little rock crevice that you kind of had to shine a flashlight or a mirror in to see the animals. Um, it actually had a pretty big opening, like if it wasn't full of snakes, that a human could sort of crawl in there and look around. Um, 
So you could stand way back like we were in the first picture with binoculars and just get a good look at a nice pile of snakes. Um, it's a pretty small den. Um, I think we saw as many as maybe 20 snakes in there at any one time. Um, the gentleman who showed us the den had seen, I think, between 20 and 30 was the most that, that he had ever seen. So it was a decent sized den, but not, not huge like some of the, I don't know, the dens of old or the garter snake dens you hear about that just have like hundreds and thousands of animals. That's not mostly what we see with uh, rattlesnake dens. Hey, Emily. Um, but it was our first one, so we were really excited. Um, so shortly after being shown this den, we visited it every few weeks because we were really excited to get to know the snakes. And we had also been thrown, um, for us at the time, because again, this was 16 years ago, um, a, a bit of a curve ball. We, at that point, were doing research on snakes in the way that it is usually done, it is still usually done, which is you see a snake and you catch them. You catch them because you need to measure them, you need to, to mark them with some sort of permanent identifier, a pit tag or a scale clip, um, you know, or maybe you're putting a radio transmitter in them. We were doing that at a site nearby as well. But one of the stipulations with being shown this den was that we were not allowed to touch any of the animals. So a lot of um, our going and observing was, was just for fun, but also we were trying to figure out how and what we could learn from snakes without putting our hands on them. And so this was also the first time that we sort of thought about how you might be able to identify snakes without using um, pit tags, which are like the little microchips that, um, that you put in dogs and cats or with radio transmitters or with, with some other sort of um, marking device. And Western diamondback rattlesnakes, which you can't see in any of these pictures, they have these bright white and black striped tails. Um, like one of their local names are coontail rattlesnakes. And that's because it, it kind of looks like a raccoon tail. And a, most, a lot of those tails are pretty evenly banded, but um, a lot of times once you start looking at them, you can see differences in the band. So we were kind of playing around with using those tails um, and some other physical features, how big they are to see, um, you know, if we could tell the difference between individuals. And we hadn't gotten very far with that. We were mostly still in the brainstorming stage, but what we decided that first year was for Thanksgiving, since neither of us were visiting any other family members and we were kind of doing a small thing at home by ourselves. we thought it would be really nice to go and visit our new rattlesnake friends on Thanksgiving day. Well, this unfortunately turned out to be um, not a great trip, <laughs> not exactly the, the holiday that, that we were looking for. Um, so when we got to the den, this was the image that we were greeted with. Um, There's a large stick near the den opening, which had not been there before. Um, and all around the opening and up into the, the area right outside where we used to see some of the animals coming out to bask was littered with shotgun shells. Hunting season um, had just opened up the week before and this was a, a popular area in general for people to come and shoot. Um, I think it was, it was dove season. And apparently some people that were into shooting stuff, I don't want to call them hunters because um, hunters wouldn't do something like this, um, just slaughtered everyone they could get a hold of at the den. So inside the den, there were pieces of bodies of our friends um, covered in flies and maggots. In the area outside of the den, we saw parts of the bigger snakes, mostly with their heads and or their rattles removed. And we think that large stick that was at the opening was used to drag out every body that they could reach so that they could bring home their little trophies with them. Um, they did leave some of the, the heads 
and the rattles behind, but a lot of them were missing too. And as you can imagine, this was just devastating, just super, super sad, um, both to see, you know, when we were hoping like for a nice day, um, you know, and that it just snakes at a den like this are just kind of sitting ducks <laughs> to use another hunting phrase um, for someone that wishes them harm. And I don't want to leave you. Well, I don't want to leave you having to look at that picture while I finish up this part of it. Um, it or with the, the idea that this was like the absolute end of this den. Um, so that was 2004. This photo was taken in 2013. And the snakes, well, not the same snakes, obviously, because most of them are dead, but other snakes have started using this den again. Um, we haven't seen as many as we saw back in the day, but we have seen the snakes start to come back. Um, so it's, you know, it's still, it's still a usable spot. Um, I have heard from some other people that know about it that it has gotten hit again in between the 2004 and 2013 period. Um, it may never be as magnificent as we saw it. And it's possible I, because again, we heard from the person who showed us that he used to see more snakes there. So it may have been even more terrific in the past before, um, you know, someone, people stumbled upon it and started hurting it. But, you know, this is, this is one den, a pretty small den in one place. And of course, as, um, oops. Um, as most of you know, um, rattlesnake roundups largely depend on dens to find enough animals for their festivals. Um, it's, it would be impossible to collect the amount of rattlesnakes that they have at roundups by any other way than getting them out of dens. And, you know, so we were heartbroken over, you know, 15, 20, 20 animals getting killed at this den. But for rattlesnake roundups, we're talking about thousands and in some years, tens of thousands that are taken um, for these horrific events. And, you know, it's, uh, it's different, you know, for us, and I think probably for most of you watching this, you know, when you're at a den or when you see pictures or videos at a den, you're just kind of overwhelmed with, how cool it is, how beautiful these animals are, how special it is that you get this peek into this other side of their life that you don't get to see when you just come across an animal crossing, crossing the road because this is really like their place and their home. But for many people, <laughs> um, that's not what they see. When they look at this picture, which I'm showing now, which is, um, a group of Arizona black rattlesnakes basking outside of their den. Um, that fills most people or many people with, with fear or loathing. And to a lot of people, you know, if you come across something like that, a big pile of rattlesnakes, you know, they see that as a threat to public safety. And so they feel like they're doing a public service probably by killing all the animals at that den. And you know, so I think a lot of a lot of our work and what we're hoping to put out there when we talk about these behaviors at den specifically, and also just about um, all the rattlesnake behavior in general. That's not what people think. Not just you know killing and, and biting people. Um, you know, we're hoping that someone can look on a pile of snakes like this and not see this, you know, horrific threat to public safety that needs to be taken care of, but a group of friends or an extended family. And so the next time that we were shown a den and in, in between times, we, we got to observe a lot of other Western diamondback dens, um, but you know, at this point, moving forward in time to 2010, um, we were working on Arizona black rattlesnakes and studying some unrelated questions that I don't want to get into because it's pretty off topic. But, um, but when we were shown um, this special place, these dens um, in central Arizona, where we did the study that we're talking about tonight, 
you know, we, we really wanted to see if there was a way that, again, without handling the animals, if we could find out what was going on here, why these animals were, were hanging out, and if there was something going on, more going on than just, you know, it gets cold in the winter and they need to find a place to be. But why were at these places, why are they at these place, this place together? So we have a couple questions. I mean, actually we had a ton of questions <laughs> when, we, when we got here, but there's a couple questions that, um, that I'm going to answer for you tonight with some of the data from the study. And the first one was, are individuals within these sites selective about whom they associate with? And when I, when I say associate, so think about that picture that's in the background now that I just showed you. Um, and so we're talking about animals that are basking together on the surface. So they all share the same den, so they associate in that way. But what we had already started to observe was that all of the animals that use the den are not hanging out together on the, out, on the outside all at once. Um, so was there something to that? Were they selecting within those den for particular members that they, they wanted to hang out with or not? And so on that, uh, whether or not they're selective in general, but also for those selections, do they have prefer preferred or avoided companions, which is a very boring way of saying, <laughs> do rattlesnakes have friends and do they have enemies, even within this den that they all share this group? So those are the two questions that largely guided a lot of this research into social behavior at this den. All right, so a little bit of background on Arizona black rattlesnakes for those who aren't familiar. Um, scientific name is Crotalus cerberus. I will try to stick to calling them Arizona black rattlesnakes. My shorthand nickname has always been Serbs. So if that, if I slip into that, that's who I'm talking about still. Um, so they're a medium sized pit viper. The adults are typically between one and a half and three feet. So not huge, not like Western diamondback or Eastern diamondback size. Um, and they live mostly in Arizona um, along the Mogollon Rim. And they also extend into like extreme Western New Mexico. And they're like a, a mid elevation rattlesnake. And the, um, so you can get them as low as around 2,900 feet. Um, usually when they're that low in elevation, they're associated with riparian areas um, because they, they really seem to need a place that has a lot of tree and brush cover. Like they don't, they're not a desert animal, even though they live in the, the Southwestern US, um, they really like the forest and they can get pretty high up in the forest as well. And then important to, to this study, for social behavior and, and why we, we pick them. I mean, we didn't pick them in the sense of like, we wanted to study social behavior and so what's a good animal, but you know, it would be harder to study, <laughs> it would have been really hard to do the study if they didn't overwinter in groups. So if they didn't have communal dens. Um, and this is something that they do not always do. Since we've done this work, um, we have, tracked some Arizona black rattlesnakes with radio telemetry in other places. And we have found that sometimes um, there are individuals who overwinter alone, even at the same place, like within crawling distance of a communal den, but they don't apparently all go to those dens, which is kind of interesting. And they also gestate in groups. And so that is referring to um, rookeries, which we talk about a lot on, our blog and in our email newsletters and stuff. So that's the, the pregnant females hanging out together over the summer before they give birth. And then often they, they also end up taking care of each other's kids. And so that's another behavior that Arizona block rattlesnakes do. And that was the, the first species that, um, that I got to observe that behavior in. All right, so at, um, at this site, we had two dens. Um, and they were only about 400 yards away from each other. And that is a distance that is easily crossed by a rattlesnake during the active season, even a young one. Um, but they were, as we'll get into, they were very separate, 
communities for the for the sake of denning. The same snakes used the same the same site um, every year. There was no mixing between those that that we have seen um, in the history now of. 10 years that we and others have been monitoring this site. I don't think anyone has documented that animals have, have switched, switched in sites. So in between those two sites, there were a little over 100 individual rattlesnakes, 26 adult females, 20 males, and 61 juveniles. So the reason the juveniles aren't assigned a sex is because for most of these snakes, we were sexing them just based on how they looked um, we didn't handle most of them, um, and they don't develop the secondary sexual characteristics that enable us to tell if they're males and females until they reach maturity. So those 61 snakes were animals that just weren't old enough to look like males or females. And in this and a lot of the other rattlesnake species in the U.S., uh, males tend to be relatively larger. They have longer tails and they also have relatively wider heads. And this gets to be pretty easy in this species to tell the difference after they're about five to six years old. And, um, <clears throat> and that's about the time when the females go into their first pregnancy and they tend to divert all their resources to that pregnancy and those babies. And the males just keep growing and keep getting bigger. And that's, that's probably why there's a difference in size for, for rattlesnakes. So as I've mentioned a couple times, um, we wanted to handle the snakes as little as possible, um, both because you know we don't want to disturb them, but also we wanted to observe their behavior and we wanted to observe their natural behavior, not just animals freaking out. And if every time we had come up to a pile of snakes outside the den, if we had started grabbing everybody, um, we, we wouldn't have gotten to see much. Um, so we needed to, to find another way to tell who was who for the, this particular study. And they don't have, Arizona black rattlesnakes do not have black and white coontails like Western diamondbacks. Um, so what we did that we modeled after both um, studies on animals where handling and pit tagging is not an option. So think about if you're studying the social dynamics of a family of whales, you're not catching those and microchipping them and scanning them every day uh, or baboons. Um, and a friend of ours who has been studying rock rattlesnakes and ridge nose rattlesnakes in the same way, and he uses variations in their pattern. So Arizona black rattlesnakes have these blotches down their back, kind of like the diamonds on Western diamondbacks. And um, they're not, uh, they don't always look the same. And it, you know, once you start looking for these, well, like you can't stop. You're always looking for these weird little blotches every time you see a new snake <laughs> that has blotches. Um, and they don't change throughout their life. So as the snake gets bigger, the blotches grow with them, but the weird shape and their position on the body don't change. So this picture um, are three photographs of the same snake. Her name is Zona. She was one of the, the earliest ones that we encountered at this site. And also because the first time we encountered her, she was not right at the den or in one of the communal nest sites. So we did catch her. And that was sort of our method in general up there as the snakes um, left the den as long as they weren't at one of these special sites. Uh, we would catch them because we were hoping to eventually follow this up with a, with a DNA study to look at how you know, relatedness plays part in their social behavior. Um, and you know, so, that, so that way when we caught them, we were able to give them another mark, which we painted their rattles because that's something that could be seen without handling them or scanning them with a microchip scanner. Um, but it also served as a backup. So when we saw Zona again, about eight months after we saw her the first time, we were able to tell by the paint on her rattle that it was Zona. And we were also able to confirm that her blotches hadn't changed. They were same basic shape in the same spot. Um, so the colored circles on these photos are, are the same blotches. So. The red one is her number nine blotch, and it has what we called 
of Florida <laughs> because you, I mean, you can kind of see it has a little tail. It sort of looks like the Florida of the U S. Um, and so that's all the red, that's all the red ones. And then the green ones, same thing it refers to like, it's a little half blotch. I forget what number that is and the blue one. And what we found with Arizona black rattlesnakes, um, is that if we could find three good marks, we've never found two snakes that have exactly the same blotch anomaly at the same blotch more than more than three. I'm not actually sure we've seen more than one, but three seem pretty safe and we usually don't have much trouble um, finding three. So that's how we were able to tell the difference. And, you know, the handling stuff aside, since we were using cameras, um, to gather a lot of these data, you know, cameras can't, or our cameras anyway, can't read microchips or scale clips because usually the scale clip markings on their belly. So we needed something like the blotches or painting their rattle um, could, would sometimes show up on the cameras too, to be able to tell the difference. And so that's how we did it. All right, so getting into the nitty gritty. So we use time-lapse cameras because at this point in time, the um, trail cameras, wildlife cameras, the ones that are triggered by motion did not really work for rattlesnakes and other cold-blooded ectothermic animals. And that's because a lot of those are based on differences in temperature. It's, it's not actually picking up movement, they're picking up differences in temperature and the snakes are often not different enough in temperature than their background to trigger the cameras. Or if they are looking for movement, especially in the spring, rattlesnakes are just not moving fast enough. So we set up time-lapse cameras at sites where we knew the snakes tended to bask in groups. So this is one of those places. Um, as you can see, when we could, we kind of overloaded the cameras so we could get close shots, we could get far away, we could capture the whole area, but also try to get close enough to where we would be able to see all those weird little blotches on the snakes. Um, we had a total of 14 cameras deployed among the different basking sites. Um, they were set to take one to two photos per minute, and that changed as the season went on, and basically as it warmed up, the snakes would start to move around a little bit more, and so then you needed more frequent photos to, to capture that so they didn't escape off the basking site um, without getting their photo taken. And we basically ran them from sunup to sundown. The cameras didn't take photos at night. They're not equipped with flash flashes. Um, and at this site, because we're at about a mile high in elevation and it's central Arizona, um, it was too cold at night for the snakes to be out. And usually we could see all the snakes going inside before the cameras shut off and it was fully dark. Um, at least for, for the bulk, like towards the end, we did this throughout the month of April and into mid, mid May ish. And so there it's starting to warm up enough where sometimes the snakes would, would still be out as the camera shut down. But also at that point, most of the animals were gone. We had to visit the, the cameras and the sites um, about every, every day to check on the batteries, to switch out memory cards and the cameras. And when we did that, if there were snakes around, although we, we tried to go early and late enough that there wouldn't be that much activity, so we wouldn't disturb their behavior. Um, but if there were snakes out, we would take, take other photos. And that was mostly just to get better angles, again, to make sure that we could capture those blotch anomalies that would enable us to tell who's who. And so that way, um, we had backups sometimes for the for the time lapse camera data, um, so we could see again just to mostly to identify them. Those didn't account for any like separate association data. All right. So I am playing for y'all. A time lapse video. Well, so this is all the pictures from a basking spot at a communal den, taken 30 seconds apart and stitched together to make a little video. This is how we looked at the data taken by the cameras. Um, we'd stitch it into a video, watch it, 
you know, and as you can see, this is actually not a site included in the study. This was a different den in another place, but there's lots of stuff going on here. And man, given enough time and years and sites, it would be really interesting to see the way that they're moving together and apart and what they're doing with each other and what all of that different stuff means. But for this study, it was really just about whether or not the snakes were together. So, so we had cameras out at all of these different basking sites. And like I said, we stitched the photos together, made little videos, um, but to, to analyze this and to be statistically rigorous, you know, we needed to, to take those, those videos and pictures and turn them into data. And so, because this was the first time anyone had really looked at this, like I said, we, we just looked at whether the snakes were associating or not. And the way that our cameras were set up, everyone in the frame was within a body, a snake's body length away from each other. And we knew from previous work that that is close enough where the snakes should be able, if they care to, identify other individuals by their smell, which is, we think, the main way that snakes communicate with each other. So if they were on the frame together, we counted that as an association. And so we're watching those videos and every time we're like taking notes on, on who's together. Oh, let's not go back to that. <laughs> Sorry, so, so the next step was after we had noted who was together, so we wanted to to calculate, so our, um, let me take a step back. So our analysis was ba based on pair associations. So the snakes were often in, in pretty big groups, although sometimes you did just see an individual by themselves or just two. Um, but it was, it was based on pairs of individuals and what we needed to do for every possible pair of individuals at each site was an estimate of how much time they spent together, the proportion of time that we saw them together. And so this cute little equation here is, is how we did that. We took the photos from the time-lapse videos and, and then calculated half-weight association index. And we picked this index because you know, we knew there, we were not capturing all the associations of these pairs. You know, we were, even though we tried to set up the cameras in such a way that they could get the whole area, you know, we knew sometimes there would be a snake that's just off screen that is still, you know, associating. He's still close enough to, for those other snakes to know that he's there and be hanging out with them, um, but we couldn't see them. So this um, particular association index, and there's a number that people, that you can use to look at social interactions, um, but this one is is less biased when we know that we're not identifying everyone, either because they're just off camera or because they're situated in such a way that we're not able to see those blotches, with, which did happen. Sometimes we would have snakes that were sitting there with a pile of other snakes and maybe just their little face or their rattles sticking out and we can't see their blotches, so they're just they're just an unknown. Um, so this places a greater emphasis on when you actually see the animals together than when you see them not um, with this pair. And that's and that's all it's doing. It's just a, just an index to give you an estimate. So the next thing we do is we look at all possible pairs at each um, den area or community. So in um, social behavior analysis, a community refers to a group of animals that interact with each other, but not with another community. Um, so you can kind of think of it, well, I mean, it's like a community or a neighborhood. So within each community, we have these, these big matrices like the table at the bottom right, um, 
where you have, you know, every, every possible pair of animals. And these are real data that's on this harsh <laughs> little bit of one of these um, matrices. And, you know, you can see that, you know, an animal's chances of being with themselves. So Adam with Adam, Adam's always with Adam because Adam is Adam is one. Um, and that's the most you can ever be together. I don't think we had one pair of, you know, two different animals that got close to one. They were almost always together. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's going to be something less than one. And those are those association indices that I mentioned. So that's great. That's a bunch of numbers. So then we had to take those numbers um, and put them into this specialized program that's called SOCIPROG. And this was developed by researchers that largely work with marine mammals. Um, and, and it was just developed for this type of work to take these matrices of association indices and to try to get out of that, what kind of social system you have, if you even have something more than randomly associated animals going on. Um, we also used those association indices to construct social networks. So kind of interesting since it's now been a long time since I started doing this work, um, <laughs> almost 10 years ago, people weren't familiar with what social networks were, but I think now we are. And I don't mean in the, in the, that you guys know what Facebook is, but kind of how Facebook looks. You can, there used to be an app where you could download your data from Facebook to, to map your own social network like this, which of course I did at the time because that was really exciting. But um, basically, let me explain what you're looking at because if you, if you haven't seen one of these before, it just looks like a mess of dots and lines. Um, but these, these graphics actually tell us a lot about the social system of these animals without doing any more statistics. So here we go. So MC and ACR, ATR, are the two different communities at this study. The two places that I mentioned are 400 yards apart, but the animals do not mix, at least um, during the denning season. Each circle or dot um, is called a node, and that represents an individual snake. The males are colored blue, the females are orange, and those unsexed juveniles are gray. So you've probably noticed that some of the circles are different sizes and what that size means, that doesn't have anything to do with how, like how old they are or how big they are. Um, that has to do with how well connected they are. So the more times that we see an animal with another animal. So the more time they're out there associating with another animal, they have a bigger circle. So you can kind of think of each, each one of these, each one of these dots, like the really big circles, those are your social butterflies, your extroverts, you know, that friend that you have that like knows everybody and is very well connected. And the lines going from one dot to another, well, that represents a connection. And so like, like the dots, lines are a varying thickness or weight. And so a really thin line means that those two animals that the line is connecting were seen together one time. And the super thick dark lines means that they were seen together a lot more than that. So it's thicker the more often they're seen. And so if you look around some of the biggest dots, you notice those tend to have a lot of lines and a lot of thick lines going between them and some of the other animals. Um, and then this is, especially when I'm giving this presentation, um, you know, projected onto a wall, most people don't even notice the tiny little dots off to the side. So at kind of the far left side of the graphs, there's a line of dots next to where it says MC. Those are individual animals who were never seen with another snake. So again, so at, um, at MC, there were about 90 animals that, that used that site. And even though they're all staying in the same place over the winter, they were all seen at these group basking sites at least once, 
but there were that many animals who never used those basking sites when there were other snakes out at them. Um, and then there was, I think just one, one of those little single dots that was only seen alone at the smaller site ATR. So I think we can already get a picture just from these graphs that these animals aren't behaving randomly. Um, a what if they were just sort of coming out and everybody was hanging out with everyone, you know, the same amount without making any choices or having any preference, um, these would be really boring. All the lines would be the same size. All the circles would be the same size. Um, you wouldn't have that you may be able to pick out, especially on the MC graph, you can kind of see there's like sort of a cluster on the right and a cluster on the left that are kind of like little, you know, sub communities or cliques of animals that tend to, to hang out together. And there wouldn't be any of that. It would be, it would be very, very boring. I used to include a picture of what that looks like and maybe I still should. So even just from graphing out like this, um, before any other statistics are done, you're already getting a picture that the snakes are doing something that isn't just randomly like hanging out just because they, you know, they all share the same pile of rocks. It gets better. <laughs> um, so these, um, you know, at, it, and at this point in, in my career when I did this, um, I'd taken several statistics classes. I'd even written some other paper the statistics and the analysis for analyzing social behavior is so different from anything else. And it is, it's very confusing. Um, and even every time I revisit this to talk about it, I have to, to kind of relearn it too. So, so don't feel bad if it's confusing is what I'm saying. Cause it is, it, it just is confusing. Um, it's not the sort of, uh, it's not the same sort of analysis you're used to with other, with other science stuff, unless you also study social behavior. And then hopefully I'm explaining this correctly. <laughs> um, so we found that they, they do choose who they're associating with and avoiding others. And so what that SOCHPROG program does is for each day, because we assumed that there could be some external factors that have nothing to do with social behavior and who they choose that is making them come outside of their den at all on a certain day. Like some days it might be too cold for any of the juveniles to come out. Or, you know, we seem to see that the different age and sex classes kind of came out in waves. Like males tended to leave the den first and pregnant females tended to never leave <laughs> and just sort of hang out. Whereas those who had given birth the previous year because they were likely very, very hungry, they came out, basked a day, and like left. So there, there were other factors that determined if we would see them at all that day. Um, so that program would take all the animals that we had seen out that day. Um, and of course it knew because we told them, you know, who had associated with who. And then it basically would like model every possible variation of that. It would take all those associations and, and mix them up and put them in completely different groups. And it did that, I forget how many times we told it to do that, like 10,000 times or something. Um, and what you get after you mix it up a lot is you get a picture of what random looks like. If they're just associating with, you know, again, kind of throw up the cards and see what kind of piles they, they land in and they're gonna be different every time. Um, and so you get a picture of like what a population or what a community of randomly associating snakes look like. And then you can compare that to what our animals are doing. And so the graph, the graphs, um, we have the, the bigger site MC on the left and the smaller site ATR on the right. And it starts off with the, with the all category. So just looking at with all possible types of pairs of snakes. Um, and then it's female juvenile, female female, female male, male male, male juvenile, and juvenile juvenile. The orange bars are what the real snakes are doing. And the gray bars are what those like randomly associated snakes that were modeled from the Sochprog program. And what the graph is showing 
is it's it's not showing like the number of associations. So so what's on the, the y-axis is how variable they are. And what you would expect if you have animals that are making choices about who they want to sit with and who they're trying to avoid is that that is going to be more variable than randomly associated individuals because they don't care and they're just sitting out with whoever. Um, and so that's what we see with almost all of these categories is that the orange bar is much greater than the gray. And we didn't just use a graph for this. We, uh, you know, the social prog program like allows you to do statistics where you can get a p-value to look at, you know, if this is statistically significantly different. And it was in all cases except female-female and juvenile-juvenile pairs at the smaller site, ATR. And, you know, you can never say for sure, but there were only 19 individual snakes that used ATR. And there was a very large proportion of males there. So there just weren't a lot of females and juveniles. So it would have been really hard for them to show any statistical significance because they were small. But, you know, I, it could also be that they're just doing things differently because they're individual snakes and they just do do different stuff. So the other question we wanted to get at besides this, just this broad of like whether they're making choices is if they have special associations or special bonds or what some papers call them or what we call them when we're talking about human-human relationships are friends. So just, you know, we see, it felt like we saw Priscilla and Mole Man together a lot, but are those two, you know, actually friends? Did we see them together enough to be friends? And so what we found was that, yeah, some rattlesnakes do have friends. Also, some of them didn't <laughs> in our study. And the way we looked at this was, you know, thinking back to those association indices that estimated um, how much time different pairs spent together. Um, so again, we have the social prog program generate what um, sort of like uh, the amount of time a random pair of snakes would be together. And, you know, we class classified following some, some other studies on other animals um, that if a pair of snakes were their association indices. So if they were hanging out together more than twice as much as what that, that random pair of snakes was doing, then we called that friends or preferred companions, I think is what I used in the thesis because my committee would not let me use the word friends, whatever. Um, and this was actually after we had gotten rid of all the, the zero associations. So we, we didn't include that when we were calculating what the average random snake would do. We wanted to get rid of the zeros to make this as conservative as possible. Um, so yeah, we did, we did find some. So there were the only type of friendship that we did not see were male males. And that was also a pretty small group of animals. And you would see them together a lot, but Again, this just says that there was never um, any two that were together enough to pass that threshold into the friends, but lots of female-female pairs, um, and there were female-male and female-juvenile and male-juvenile and juvenile-juvenile um, pairs of friends too. All right, so this is one of those pair of friends and this is Spooky and Allie. And Spooky is a snake that we actually, the first year we were there, we got to see her um, gestate with um, not Spook or not Allie, <laughs> but some other females and give birth was one of the, the first ones that we got to see take care of their babies. But those two snakes, um, I, they were the two that spent almost all of their time together, which was pretty cool. Um, so they did, that seemed to be a pretty, pretty solid friendship. 
All right. So I wanted to see if I could pull up actually before we go to questions. Um, one more video. Because there were, um, you know, I kind of alluded to this in the title and there was a question about it as well of what does this, what does this mean for conservation? Um, and I think we can kind of look at that in a couple different ways. So it makes for some really fun headlines that snakes have friends. You know, that's not, not something when we started doing this that I ever thought I would see. Um, so that was really cool to see this year um, about garter snakes. And then later in the Arizona Republic about our study and that rattlesnakes have friends too. Um, but, you know, if we think about some of the, the conservation actions that we take with snakes in sort of the traditional conservation sense. So doing head starting programs, which is when you raise animals in captivity and then release them when you're trying to build up a population um, or conservation translocations. So say there's an area like somebody's getting ready to build a golf course and they want, and there's a snake den there and you want to remove all the snakes and move them somewhere else. And you know, for, well, ever, <laughs> um, the social system of snakes is not something that's been considered at all when people are thinking about moving snakes around or even doing something like um, evaluating how good this habitat is for species. There's a lot of emphasis placed on, um, do they have stuff to eat there? Do they have, you know, are there other snakes there for them to mate with? Um, you know, are there, are there sufficient predators there so they can fit well into that ecosystem? And the, the whether there are snakes there to mate with has just been sort of, I think, assumed that if there are other snakes, everything will be fine. Um, or if there aren't other snakes, but it's otherwise good habitat, well, then this would be great because then there'll be plenty of food and places for the snakes to live. But, you know, thinking about um, how they interact with other animals, and we just really barely know anything about this. You know, if you find, you know, a den that's active with a species of snakes and you want to build up that population, you know, we don't know if you take a strange snake and stick them at that den, what the other snakes do. Um, we know in general that snakes are, or vipers are fairly tolerant of each other. There's a lot of territory overlap during the active season. Um, and while, you know, males will fight for females, they don't usually fight over other resources like food and places to be, you know, they're, they're pretty tolerant of each other. But we don't know how that plays with different dens. You know, I've mentioned a couple times, we had these two places that were really close to each other. And yet we never, and I'm sure those snakes must have encountered each other over the summer. But when it came time to, to hole up for the winter, same groups every time. You didn't have any mixing. And there could be a very good reason for that. So that you know, that could play a role and is definitely something to consider when you're moving snakes around or evaluating a place to live or um, a place for them to live. And it's not something that I think has been, been taken into account when, um, you know, aside from translocation, uh, trans conservation translocation, also for moving so-called nuisance animals out of yards and into some place that like, you know, it looks like good habitat and that there's like food and shelter, but are you moving them into a different society or a different community where they're not going to know anyone and it's not going to be a good fit for them or out of their community where they have a very important role to play. Think of those, those big circles that are big connectors with other snakes. And we don't know what that means for them, but it could mean a lot of things, it could be very important. And so moving animals around um, can mess that stuff up and is, you know, something that hasn't been thought about a whole lot, but I think is something that we need to think of as we're 
moving animals around. And then there is, of course, as y'all probably expected to hear from us, um, thinking about snakes at a den as not being a pile of vicious, cold-blooded killers that are out to get us, but um, these are a bunch of buddies. Um, they chose to be together. Some of these animals are friends. Some of these animals are like, like I live in your den, but I don't hang out with her because like I don't like her. I don't like him. Um, you know, or like expanding from that, these same areas and these same animals are ones that are gathering together to give birth, helping to raise each other's kids and babysitting um, and males and juvenile snakes also stopping by and taking care of that. That paints a very different picture of snakes than, than most people would consider even, and honestly, sometimes, especially so, <laughs> some snake scientists. I mean, we just don't think about snakes that way. And it's a lot easier to do some of the gnarly things we do to an animal that we don't think of as having friends or being a caring mom or babysitting. Um, and you start to, to talk about snakes that way and tell stories of them doing those kind of things um, that can have a bigger impact or a different kind of large impact on their conservation because that really helps with the, the people side of conservation that we have to consider. It's not just about knowing what animals or plants or places need our help and need to be conserved and what we need to do to help. It's also about making sure that the community of humans that lives around there or enjoys that place um, cares and is into it and engaged with it. And it's been a thing for snake projects to be shut down or changed because, because people just don't like snakes and they don't want us doing anything positive for them. And so we're really hoping that, um, and it's, it's really cool giving this presentation and talking about this now in fall of 2020, because earlier this year, a study came out seeing some of these same things in common garter snakes, which are not, very, as you can imagine, not very closely related to Arizona black rattlesnakes, but we're seeing some of the same stuff with the social networking and making choices about who they associated with and that they chose to be around other snakes rather than separate. And so I think it's important to start talking about snakes this way and thinking about snakes this way. And I really hope that um, other people can do work like this too, because I need to find out all the things about snakes, right? Those are cool. So, all right, now I'll take questions if y'all have any. And I'm just gonna start reviewing the chat just to see what's there. Cause again, there's a little bit of a delay so it makes it kind of weird for interacting with questions. Um, yeah, Katie on YouTube says that this is really interesting. Never considered that snakes might be social animals at all. Yeah, I, no one did. I. When we started this study almost 10 years ago, um, we were laughed at the most by other snake scientists um, who just, you know, assumed that, and this is, this was the thought for so many years that the, you know, the snakes were together only because there were limited places for them to be. The only reason that they would share a site like that is because they had nowhere else to go where they wouldn't freeze to death. But because of our experience looking at places um, like Jason's den, the, the Western Diamondback den in the very beginning, um, that's just outside of Tucson. The snakes are not freezing to death outside of Tucson, Arizona. Like it's not, it's not that cold. There are plenty of rock piles. They could be by themselves if they wanted to. And actually what we've seen with Western Diamondbacks is they will often be together and then be separate for reasons that are very different than what's going on at Arizona black rattlesnake dens. Um, so, so yeah, so we knew it, 
that didn't explain all associations of snakes. Um, so it's, again, it's really nice to see that now there are studies coming out in other species of snakes that are showing the same thing. So that's cool. <clears throat> um, so Steve asks, if we know what snakes use to identify each other. That's a very good question. So there, were, so there was a study by Rulon Clark and colleagues um, a few years before we did this work that, um, that demonstrated that snakes could identify other individuals. And it didn't really look at the mechanism, but we assume that it's chemical communications. Um, snakes, they can see, they're not blind. Um, and they can hear some things, but their hearing is pretty limited but they have a really awesome sense of smell. And there has been other work that, that shows that they can do things like um, when rattlesnakes are rattling, they release an, an alarm pheromone, which is, which is an odor um, that's used for communication and other snakes can pick up on that. And so we assume that that is how they are identifying other individuals is by their smell. And a few times at the dens and other places um, you'll see a new snake kind of approach an existing pile of snakes and they'll kind of rub their face on each other a little bit. And there's like increased tongue flicking. Whereas usually when they're sitting outside a den, there's just nothing going on. And, and so I think that's their way of kind of, you know, trying to figure out who that other snake is and if it's, you know, someone who's supposed to be there or not, I guess. Um, Annika asked if we ended up doing the genetic analyses um, and did we see any substantial friendships between closely related snakes, siblings, parent, offspring, cousins, etc.? Excellent question. Um, no, unfortunately, we have not been able to do the genetic analyses um, because when we were spending every day there doing this study, our emphasis was on getting the behavioral observations, which meant that we did not get to handle a lot of snakes. You know, our, our rule was that they had to leave these social sites before we would pick them up um, to get uh, genetic samples. Um, they don't shed, <laughs> at least um, outside of their den where we can see it in the spring. So that would have been excellent, but not, not an option for us. We really had to get a hold of the animals to take a scale clip or a little bit of blood. And we rarely saw them as they left. Um, they're, they're very sneaky about it. Um, so we, we didn't, we don't have, we didn't have enough samples to do, to do a rigorous study to be able to compare. Now we do know about some, um, mother and offsprings, or at least, um, females and babies that share the same nest, although they, they could be, depending on the nest, if there's another mother there, you know, it could be her kids. So we did have some of that, but there wasn't, um, and again, there weren't enough instances of it to statistically look at if those were more likely to be friends or not. Um, but a couple pairs that we knew of um, surprisingly didn't hang out that much. Although we did get, we have some some cool videos, which actually we're like working on putting together to share right now of a mother, a, a really sweet interaction between a mother and a, and a baby from the previous summer at the den in the spring hanging out. Um, but, but yeah, not, not enough times together to, um, to stay. And part of that, at least with the, the newborn babies or the, the youngest babies is that they leave pretty early. I think they're also hungry, eager to get going in life because they're born not that much long before they have to, to go into the den. Um, and I imagine some of them do that without eating at all. So they're, they're anxious to, to get out of there as soon as they're ready to start hunting and stuff. All right. So stuck in Florida says at one time they thought only humans had those social interactions and then, yeah, I know totally. And so, and then they moved to like, well, I guess it's just like primates and it's like, okay, I guess all mammals. And now studies like this are showing that interaction and these are happening and, fish and reptiles, um, a, a lot of studies like this on birds too, of course. I don't think many people have trouble being skeptical of, of birds being social. Um, yeah, and and honestly, like some of the, the most like complex and interesting social systems are in insects. 
Um, so it's definitely not just humans or not just mammals. Um, working together and being together is a, a strategy that works for a lot of animals. Um, and there's even like some stuff starting to come out about how plants cooperate with each other, which is cool. Um, yeah, so Katie also says ants do as well. Yeah, it is, there's um, there's a lot of, when I was first digging into this, when we started this with this study, um, looking at some of the insect stuff, it's, it's really, really cool. All righty, so we have been going over an hour and I did not mean to keep y'all all night. This is getting late for, for some old people. But um, I, so I think I'm gonna wrap it up here shortly. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad that you liked it. Oh, here it is. Sorry, I was like juggling around with um, technology, trying to, uh, <laughs> to find the camera again. So you can see a face instead of that just still image. But I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. So this will um, be up. And available is a recording on YouTube and Facebook. Um, and yeah, feel free to keep putting questions in the comments in either of those places. If more stuff comes up, um, we'll keep an eye on it and, you know, get to them as soon as we can. And we really appreciate it. This has been <laughs> um, a tough year for everybody, us included. And, you know, um, yeah, it's it's nice that even though we haven't been able to do any in-person present presentations that I love that this has kind of forced us into and made it um, like a lot more common for everybody to to interact online like this and, and share the information this way, which for us also enables us to get it out there to a lot more indifferent people than, um, you know, who can show up to a, a presentation at, at our little um rural beautiful forest in southwest New Mexico. But, but thank you guys and have a good night and uh, keep in touch on social media or on the email list. We couldn't do this stuff without you.